Ouais, tu vois là, tu vas aussi. Tu... Essaie de jouer sur les deux. Ouais, tu arrives à l'avoir ça. Parfait, ouais. Bah, nickel. Je enregistre là, voilà. c'est pas grave. Parce oh, non, c'est bon, t'as hein. c'est parfait. Non, non, mais si t'as les mouvements comme ça, c'est pas grave. Fais-les vite, tu ouais. sais que t'es propre. Ouais. Parce que de toute façon, ta caméra, elle n'est pas dans le truc. Donc, je vais prendre les autres. Et moi, je vais essayer la mienne. Ouais. Good morning, everyone. It's a wonderful day today, and there's no better way to start than asking our DG to introduce the topic. Oh, well, that's a short and, uh, <laughs> and sweet introduction. Thank you very, very much. Um, and, uh, well, good morning, uh, everyone, uh, and happy uh, Women's uh, International Day. Uh, to everyone. Um, the 8th of March uh, is an important occasion uh, to honor uh, the positive impact uh, that women have in all areas of life, frankly. So it is also uh, an important uh, opportunity to raise awareness um, and take stock of the progress, so looking back, uh, identify the remaining challenges, so looking at the present, and promoting uh, further inclusiveness. Um, over the last uh, few years, we have put a special focus uh, on this issue, um, and, and I think that the progress we made is, is quite clear. Um, and the most um, obvious uh, illustration of this progress uh, was the launch of the Joint Declaration uh, on Trade and Gender at our 11th uh, ministerial conference in Buenos Aires in December. If I'm not mistaken, we had 118 uh, members uh, signing the declaration, uh, seeking uh, to advance uh, conversations on this topic. So this was a truly remarkable event uh, and moment. Uh, it has put uh, these issues um, on the WTO agenda like never before. Uh, it is therefore fitting uh, that we uh, have prepared an entire week of events at the WTO to mark uh, International uh, Women's Day. And I would like to thank everyone uh, involved in this effort. Uh, I see Anoush here. Uh, Monica, I don't see her, but I'm sure she's somewhere. Um, anyway, congratulations to everyone. The program um, uh, is very diverse. It includes uh, exhibitions, uh, debates, uh, and training sessions uh, on issues such as female leadership and organizational culture. Um, and our topic for this session um, is the role of trade uh, and the WTO uh, in women's economic empowerment, um, ensuring that women can, in fact, participate fully uh, in the economy is essential to building uh, the inclusive society that we all, that we all uh, want to see. Of course, it is also essential to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals um, agreed in New York. Uh, we all have a role to play in making this a reality, um, but we still have, I have to say, a long, very long way to go. Um, women are half uh, the world's uh, working age population, but they generate only 37% of GDP. Um, in most countries, 
women earn 60 to 75 percent of what men receive for the same work. Um, no society uh, can reach its full potential if half the population cannot properly participate in the economy. Now, as we know, uh, that the benefits of greater equality can be huge, um, we have to do more work. Um, World Bank data uh, suggests, for example, that the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women uh, would raise uh, world uh, per capita productivity by 40%. That's huge. Um, McKinsey uh, estimates that closing the gender gap could add at least $12 trillion uh, to global uh, GDP by 2025. Um, so what is preventing us uh, from realizing this potential? That's the question. Um, and let's look at some barriers uh, to progress here. And, and there are many. Uh, we'll highlight just three. The first uh, is the legal and regulatory barriers that are clearly higher for women. Uh, in many economies, uh, female entrepreneurs uh, face more obstacles than their male uh, counterparts. These barriers can range uh, from difficulties obtaining credit uh, and registering property all the way to opening a bank account, something as simple as that. Um, in 155 out of 190 uh, economies uh, studied by the World Bank, women do not have the same legal rights as men. Uh, and that means that there is at least one law uh, impeding uh, women's economic opportunities. Now, the second barrier that I want to mention is working conditions. So, gender bias uh, can result in unfavorable and even dangerous uh, working conditions for women. And evidence suggests that in some places, women are disproportionately harassed and ask for bribes at border crossings, for example. Um, and attitudes also remain a real problem, uh, and, and everywhere. It's not just <coughs> in some countries that you would say these are obvious candidates. No, everywhere. Um, I would point to a survey of Canadian uh, uh, women-owned SME exporters that found out that 75% of these women perceived what they called, and I quote, a lack of respect uh, by male business owners and a refusal to be taken seriously. Uh, Seventy-five percent. Now, and by the way, this is not to indict Canada. Uh, on the contrary, this is to commend uh, the efforts uh, of Canada in undertaking this kind of research uh, in identifying these uh, discriminatory attitudes that women traders face. Um, a third barrier that I want to mention uh, is access to education, uh, to knowledge and skills. Uh, low levels of literacy are more prevalent among female traders. Um, in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, there are 150 million fewer literate women than men. Uh, and the same applies uh, to awareness about cross-border trade regulations and procedures. Now, these are just few examples. Of course, there are many other factors which can hinder uh, women's full participation in trade, such as financial and digital exclusion, uh, or political underrepresentation, uh, which of course stands in the way of meaningful change. Um, eliminating these barriers uh, would make a huge difference for economic empowerment for women, um, but not only that, uh, also for economic growth and social development more broadly across the board. So the next question is, uh, what can we do to make a difference? Now, trade certainly has a role to play, and it can help to create job opportunities and provide better salaries. Uh, it can encourage uh, education and skills development, and also increase financial independence. Uh, but the benefits uh, of trade in tackling these issues are not automatic. It just doesn't mean you, I trade, therefore I'm helping. No. We need to take action in a variety of ways to make sure that we're more inclusive. Um, and I'd like to address this uh, from two angles. First, looking at the WTO as an institution, and then as an important institution of economic governance. And second, looking at our role as an organization and as an employer. Now, in my role as international gender champion, I pledged to take action on both of these fronts, and we are delivering, I have to say. 
As an institution, we are increasingly looking at how we can act in this area. Um, and to help guide this work, uh, we have launched an action plan on trade and gender. Um, we now have a women and trade web page um, to provide a single port of call uh, for information about work in the WTO here, the work of the WTO. And we are partnering up uh, with the World Bank uh, on generating new data and facilitating the understanding of the impact of trade on women. <coughs> of course, uh, this work is now framed by the uh, Buenos Aires Declaration on Trade and Gender. And as I said earlier, the declaration was a very important moment uh, in a political sense, uh, but it also provided some focus for our conversations here. So the participants of this initiative agreed on some very specific points uh, they committed to work together in the WTO to remove barriers uh, for women's economic empowerment and increase their participation in trade. And in doing that, uh, they committed to explore ways to tackle barriers uh, to women in trade and in public procurement markets. Um, they will be exchanging information about best practices and collecting relevant economic data, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. One of the biggest problems we have is data. We don't have enough of that. Um, they, uh, these countries, will seek on a voluntary basis uh, to use our trade policy review uh, to emphasize uh, policy developments that contribute to gender equality. Um, they also urge uh, that trade-related development assistance uh, should be better oriented um, towards uh, gender issues, um, and they committed uh, to keep the conversation going uh, through dedicated events uh, and discussions on all of these issues. So this is work in progress, of course, uh, but it is a very important step. Um, I am confident that the Buenos Aires uh, Declaration will provide uh, a very important platform to advance this work and help WTO make a real impact as an institution. Now. I also want to address our role as an employer. Uh, and over the years, we have strived to improve uh, gender parity uh, in the Secretariat. Uh, we have worked to ensure uh, that gender uh, matters are well integrated into our administrative policies, such as the promotion policy. In 2017, for example, there were 40 promotions in the WTO. Uh, and more than half of them were awarded to women. And when we look at um, just the performance-based promotion exercise, there were 24 promotions, and of those, 16 uh, were awarded to women. So that means that two-thirds of our performance-based uh, promotions went to female staff members. Um, in addition to that, we are continuously uh, working on encouraging uh, women to step forward as leaders uh, through our uh, human resources organized workshops and coaching uh, activities. We're also making efforts to ensure that the WTO is a safe uh, working environment and that we are uh, currently developing uh, a policy uh, to address harassment at work and that has been bottom up so the secretariat, the staff themselves, they are involved in developing this. Um, and we have, um, I have to say, a zero tolerance approach here. Now, this all represents good progress, uh, but of course, much more remains to be done. Uh, for example, uh, women are still uh, underrepresented here in the WTO in senior management positions. So that's something that we need to address as well. Um, so good progress, but not enough. I think that is a fair description of where the broader gender debate stands today. Uh, we have come a long way uh, in recent years, but I think we always have to challenge ourselves uh, to do more. Um, so do we truly practice what we preach um, as leaders, as managers, as colleagues? Where <coughs> could we do more? Now, when we look at certain practices, and this is, this is a key point, when we look at a certain practice of how things were done a generation ago, um, sometimes you can't believe it. You know, how could this happen? Uh, that was just a generation ago. So I think the focus now, what we have to consider, is what are the things that we are blind to today, that we don't see it? What are the things that we see, that, that we do today, that will shock the next generation. 
I think that is the kind of question that we have to put to ourselves. So we have to keep this discussion going. Uh, we have to keep deepening the debate. And I have no doubts we all have a role to play here individually, um, institutionally, collectively, um, because it is only together uh, that we will build the inclusive society that I'm sure we all, we all uh, want to see. So those are a few words uh, to, keep, uh, to kick it off. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Back to you. Thank you, DG. Uh, you've drawn the perfect sort of image. As you mentioned, uh, the Buenos Aires uh, Declaration was a starting point, and since 2017, you made sure that the issue of trade and gender is dealt with here, the links between the two, uh, but also how trade empower women and vice versa. Uh, but if I may, I think it goes even back further with the Ugre round, when the WTO took on board full trade in agriculture and trade in textile, which are traditionally areas where women were active, already, consciously or unconsciously, the WTO was introducing the topic of women. And still today, in services, the statistics prove it, more women than men are uh, active. And on this point, I draw your attention on the brochure prepared by Anoush and her team, full of interesting statistics. Uh, the panel this morning, the first one, is diverse of active government officials and business people, men and women, because that, it's important to realize that the issue of trade and women is not an issue just for women, and the participation today uh, proves it. Um, just before I pass the floor uh, to the speakers, I'd like to recall the four main objectives of the WTO for the conversation this morning. So for the trade and woman, trade and gender, the first objective is raising awareness on the link between trade and woman. And thank you for participating in this this morning. The second one is to facilitate the WTO members' action in that field. The third one, as mentioned by the DG, is to generate data to help governments and business people promote trade and women. And finally, the WTO focus on training government officials and business people on trade. On this, I'd like to raise two general questions and invite the speakers uh, to give their perspective. And the first one is why do we need to empower women? And the second one, what do we know about women's empowerment today? And what else do we need to know? So I would invite first the ambassador uh, from Japan, Ambassador Hiara, to give us his perspective. Uh, thank you, Gabrielle, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for including me uh, this uh, very important uh, and interesting uh, uh, event. Um, to answer to the first question, uh, I'm just wondering uh, uh, what empower means. Empower means uh, give power. And when uh, I look around myself, my wife, my sisters, uh, my colleagues of the mission or colleagues, ambassadors in the WTO and the UN, they are all, you know, women are all powerful already. Uh, so I, I'm wondering why we should give them more power. Uh, but uh, when I look uh, more broadly, uh, the society, for instance, Japan, uh, that uh, women's power uh, is not fully utilized. And this issue is really compelling issue for Japan because our population uh, already peaked out and uh, working population is declining. Uh, and even the population itself declined last year by 400,000. That means twice the size of, the, of Geneva. So how to keep the vitality of the society, how to keep our economy at the level or you know, the enough to survive? Uh, we have to utilize the uh, women resources fully. That is our imperative. So this uh, empowerment of women is a sort of uh, you know, survival subject for Japan. So that is why I think uh, the current government 
uh, tries to put every, uh, uh, every element necessary uh, to empower women, particularly in economic activities, including trade. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, to me, the, the, the question looks very odd. Why should we ask this question in this time and age, that why should we empower women? Because I think this is the fundamental issue that we have to empower women. So um, uh, I, I, I'm a bit discomforted with this thought that there's still people who want to question this, this fundamental issue. So uh, you see, uh, my perspective on this is that we have to realize that workplace and marketplace is not friendly to women as, as we speak. So uh, the reality of men and women when they come out for their economic pursuit is different. When a woman comes to work, she carries a triple burden. When I come to my office, I have only one obligation, that is my TORs. When a woman comes to work, she has the productive burden of the employer. Then she has the reproductive burden, the, the family duties, and then the burden of the care economy. And then if you lay out the marketplace and the workplace similar to two, I think she's greatly handicapped. So we have to configure the way we do business, the way we manage our workplace, uh, as DG said, in our HR, in our performance management, the way we want our women colleagues to contribute we have to think through their reality, which is the triple burden. Secondly, uh, you see, the DG cited figures, the huge economic opportunity that we are missing at by not fully uh, getting uh, the women to contribute. I give you an example of Pakistan. In all the public sector universities, and we have huge public sector education, graduate level, postgraduate, MPhil, PhD, 53% of the students are women. In medical school, 70% of the students are women because the admission is merit-based. But when you come to the workplace, labor force participation is only 20%. So this means there is something fundamentally wrong the way we have laid the economic uh, field for women. Uh, I said 70% uh, doctors in medical schools and you have less women working in the medical uh, in the medical facilities you see in in societies like pakistan one unpleasant experience of harassment with a women worker she's off the job for life so we have to see that we have to treat uh, women workers women businessmen women entrepreneurs differently and that's the most important thing that until unless we empower them and uh, we have institutional affirmative action, uh, not even uh, individual based. It should be institutional, it should be embedded in law, it should be embedded in our policies that we have to address for this historical handicap that the women have had. Thank you. Thank you very much. DG, if you want to intervene at any time, you let me know. Otherwise, I was going to ask a business uh, person or from uh, Wealth. Madame Zahidi, what is your perspective on this question? Why do we need to empower a woman? You're here, so you are powerful. Well, I, I would just slightly um, qualify what the World Economic Forum is. We're an international organization for public-private collaboration. We're an international organization for public-private collaboration, and so it's not just, I think, the view of business um, that, that's represented at the forum. We've been, uh, for the last uh, 11 years, uh, producing an annual ranking uh, around gender gaps, ranking countries on what they are doing to close gender gaps and how fast progress is going. For those of you who know the statistic already, don't raise your hand. For others, take a guess how long it will be if we continue at the current pace of change. How many years before we reach gender parity? Ideas from the audience? Help us. OK. 217 years. Now, that is a glacial pace of change. So yes, in the last 10 years or so, the pace of change has picked up. 
but it is absolutely not fast enough. And so I think, as many of the other panelists have said, we need to start looking for solutions that are going to be accelerators. And part of that solution, surprisingly, I think we do all believe who are in this room here today that closing the economic gender gap is a good thing, but there are still people who need that case to be made for them. And I think we should be staunch about the values-based case. There is a moral case around this, and that is simply equality for equality's sake, because women and men are equal inhabitants of this planet and should have all of the equal resources and opportunities. And I don't think we should shy away from that values case. But at the same time, if the economic case can help, it should be strategically used. And that economic case is, of course, related to what's happening in businesses, why we know that teams that are more diverse Diverse, tend to take better decisions. Not because women are, are more risk averse and men are not. There are, there are some stats out there which I think um, some of them have been proven, some have not. But simply because with diversity you get much better set of experiences. And whether you're designing a new product or whether you're selling to a, a new customer, you're going to get better results if you have diversity in teams. The second business case is more macro. Um, and that is related to the fact that, as everyone has pointed out, there are many more women going to university in most parts of the world. In over 100 countries, there are more women going to university than men. And so the base of the white-collar talent, at least, is more female than it is male. And so that case also exists at a more macro level. And I could go on with this, but I'll just leave those two, two out there. Thank you. So it's not only a moral issue, it's a business reality. So, Ms. Uh, Galeote from IKEA, in your perspective, women in trade. Good morning, and thank you for inviting IKEA Group for this so important uh, debate. Um, I'm here representing the IKEA Group, that is the biggest uh, retailer operating under the IKEA brand. But in IKEA, we are one brand, but many companies. All of us, across the supply chain, to the retail activities, all we think that we need to empower women, because this is how it is how we live our values. So everything is started by our values. And as an expression of living our values, ac across all the IKEA companies, we see that gender <coughs> equality is at the, at the heart of the human rights. So as you said before, the values is kind of the trigger for all this kind of um, approach. Um, but as a values-based company, um, so we work b uh, in order to build and maintain a workforce that reflects the diversity of our communities and the world. And this is when you, where you can see the business case. Gender equality supports us to reach our vision, that is to create a better everyday life for the many people. Uh, because it helps us to have a better understanding of our consumers, uh, more creative yeah. and relevant home furnishing solutions, products and services, uh, because it is possible then to attract more talent by being a great place to work. Uh, and because it's also um, helping us to, to be a better IKEA by contributing to positive change in our business and in society at large. But for that, it is needed to act in different levels, as it has been already mentioned. Has to be, it's, ne it's needed to act internally, but also externally. When it comes to externally, it's how you are organizing your organization. And I, 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 I love to put you an example in the IKEA group. Now, 49% uh, of our managers are women, mm -hmm. and 54% uh, of our co-workers, so it's the name that we, we give to our employees, are women. Um, but it's also about how we act externally, right? How we um, have relations with our suppliers and service providers. Mm -hmm. We have uh, an IKEA code of conduct for suppliers that states the minimum requirements when it comes to uh, standards that has to do the, with environmental <coughs> issues, with social and working conditions. By understanding them, by working together with them, we've been able to come up with some specific improvements globally around the world when it comes to working conditions, being gender is very much on the focus. And, and acting externally is not only about this kind of business relationships, but it's also about how you engage with the local communities. And you can engage with the communities locally, very locally, but uh, I mean, having every co-working in IKEA, being an ambassador of the IKEA values, so coming up with partnerships uh, through the stores in the different local communities, but also, having international partnerships connected with social entrepreneurs and businesses to IKEA connected to the value chain uh, in order to accelerate and enable uh, women's empowerment and marginalized, uh, of course, people uh, to move from dependency to independency. 
So we are an international trade operator, but we think, uh, we believe that trade has to be sustainable and inclusive. And this means, of course, <coughs> involving women fully. <laughs> Now, um, Claire Somerville is the head of the Graduate Institute um, doing um, on the gender equality uh, group. Can you give us a bit, a few words on the result of your research and your perspective? Thank you, um, and thank you for inviting me to this, this really important panel with very uh, esteemed panelists, so uh, I appreciate that. Um, I think, listening to everybody, we're in no doubt that uh, women's economic empowerment is an imperative, moral, and a no-brainer. Um, it's good for families, it's good for societies, economies, and I think I would also add, it is good for sustainable global peace. Now, trade is not my area. Um, and I've been asked to speak here the, this morning really to speak from a more um, scholarly academic perspective. I'm from the, the Gender Centre at the Graduate Institute, which is a research centre. And this affords me the opportunity to really broaden this discussion and also ask some provocative questions, if I may. So you ask us, uh, why, why should we empower women? And I think our panellists have given us plenty of good reasons why that should be the case. But I'd really like to ask, what and who is doing that empowering? To empower assumes that there are actors and institutions that actually have the power. They are the powerful agents of change. Now, I say this because my area is predominantly gender and health. And in, over the last two decades, we have worked extensively on changing the power relationships within health systems in order to empower patients to take control of their own health. And I think there are, there are, areas, there are areas which we can learn from the health sector on their use of the concept of empowerment. The areas of empowerment, of course, go back to the 1970s to, uh, to, to uh, the alleviation of poverty in particular and, and um, marginalised communities. And I think as we're moving forward here, it is really useful to look back at the way this concept has been operationalized and not lose sight as of, of how it has mobilized in the past so that we can do it right here, right now, and into the future. So to reflect just briefly on three points of what this actually means, we have to think about power and power relations. And this is really at the heart of a gendered approach. To activate empowerment as a process, which I think we're trying to do here, and to bring gender justice and all the benefits that we've heard this morning on this panel, panel, we really have to define what that power is and what is at stake, and what are those relations of and to that power. And this means we also have to talk about systems and structures which are laden with power relations that follow certain patterns. Now, conceptually, in the field of gender studies, we would refer to this as the patriarchy. But I'm not going to give a lecture on that right now. <laughs> but I do want to alert us to the history of the concept and the processes by which we can engage and mobilise empowerment as a way to achieve and deliver on the goals that have been outlined to us here. And I think we can use that to understand women and trade. Which leads me to my second point. Women have always been traders, using exactly the same skills and tools of negotiation, value exchange and surplus, even if it's been hidden somewhat in a private sphere. And in anthropology, which is my, my discipline, we have a huge body of work from around the world that has mapped and analysed the ways in which women's exchange and trading has, has happened around the world. And just a couple of examples. Artifacts such as scales and, and weights recovered from female burial sites close to significant Viking trading centres suggest that women were active in trade and economic exchange, which rather counters our stereotype of the, uh, the Viking. When Europeans arrived in West Africa during the 17th century, it was women market traders that act as the arbiters and negotiated the deals. 
fisherwomen in Papua New Guinea travelled extensively in this century to to um, extend their trade and, some, and trade their surplus in fish in, in exchange for, for sago. I could list thousands more. And when the DG mentioned about data, I think we can look back at some of these examples of women traders in the past, and we have data somewhere. <laughs> it may not be in the um, way that we think of it right now. So my points are three. Trade, women in trade, not new. If we're to take an empowerment approach, and I think we should, um, it's useful to look back on how that approach has had great successes, but some failures over the last 40 years. And finally, that an approach like this requires a critical self-examination of those gendered power relations. Thank you for this very broad presentation and the reference to evidence of the role of women traditionally. Uh, whether we have uh, sufficient data is, uh, I think, a distant question. For the second round of questions, I'd like to invite you to be a bit more um, uh, practical, because I think everybody agrees there's a need to empower women. It's good for business. It's good for government. It's good for sustainable development. Now, how? And uh, if I may, Ambassador Yara, what are the tools for you, the tools for women empowerment in relation to trade? And because the time is short, you may also, if you want, uh, bring this back to the WTO. What do you think the WTO can do? Uh, the DG has initiated a lot, but practical tools and what can be done here? Thank um, you. Thank you. Um, I think the WTO is a place where we deal with the trade rules. And when I look at trade rules, they are basically gender neutral. So the question is whether we have to introduce some sort of special and differentiated differential treatment for women in trade rules, but my answer is no. Uh, but on the other hand, when we look uh, at the reality uh, in economic activities and the social you know, the relations, uh, there is no gender equal in many countries. So how can we deal with that reality in the application of uh, the WTO rules? So we have to, I think we have to be at least gender sensitive. We have to be aware of the reality. For instance, uh, the talented woman, uh, but they have to stay at home for various reasons or the, the women who are in the rural area cannot go to city to work, uh, or the, uh, in developing countries there are many women who don't have a bank account or no access to finance. So how to deal with those issues within the context of uh, the work of WTO? And uh, when I think about that, uh, it, uh, I notice that there are some useful enablers uh, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, digitization or e-commerce or ICT uh, or fintech, uh, those are enablers which allow women at home to have access to business or women uh, staying in rural area to engage in global trade. Uh, so how to encourage those enablers in the WTO? Uh, one way is to discuss uh, the uh, e-commerce and the digitization and uh, to uh, negotiate the necessary rules. That is one way of contributing uh, to uh, bridging uh, the trade rules and the, the reality. And uh, second is uh, the uh, many uh, women uh, are major workforce in uh, micro and small businesses. So how to facilitate those uh, micro and small businesses. Uh, and there are areas uh, in the WTO work, for instance, uh, transparency or facilitating trade. Those are the elements uh, which are very useful for the activities of uh, MESMIs. And through uh, activating those MESMIs activities, mm -hmm. we can give more chances for women uh, in workplace. So there are certain things that we can do without changing the uh, gender-neutral nature of trade rules. Thank you. Thank you. So a lot of the agenda's item are already covered, if I can 
um, understand you properly. Ambassador Shaw, from an emerging um, economy, what are the emerging issues uh, typical to, to, to your country? I was impressed by the statistics. 70% doctors are women, uh, at university studying medicine are women, but many, many less are uh, in the workforce. So, practical solution. Do you believe in positive discrimination? Thank you. Uh, a bit about um, what, what WTO can do for this, and then I, I turn to your question. You see, um, <coughs> we are always asking for inclusive trade. In our view, the real uh, touchstone of inclusive trade is that how trade policies and practices treat women. If they don't give uh, a level playing field, uh, opportunity to women, then it can be anything but inclusive trade. And uh, we agree uh, trade doesn't have a gender, but we have to accept that it has a very strong gender impact. <coughs> and it is not always, always gender neutral. <coughs> uh, we have seen uh, data that how uh, the World Bank uh, uh, the business law and women report uh, says that uh, how women are uh, legally institutionally discriminated in many countries and we have uh, a number of challenges uh, pointed to us even. Uh, we just heard about, I call it the 3G report, uh, the global gender uh, gap report and uh, many countries like us, we do very well on health and education uh, achievements but when it comes to economic uh, opportunities. Uh, we are literally dragged down to the last cohort or, or the political opportunity. So, what to do? Uh, so uh, there are two challenges. Uh, one is that, yes, there is a huge social, cultural, uh, political uh, challenges that we have to face. But at the same time, you see uh, this, this data gathering and uh, uh, show, showing you where you stand is also important. But it's also important for us to understand that how different people are measuring us. Because at times, you do your best and you feel as if you are running on a treadmill. So it is important that we understand that how businesses, how think tanks are looking at it. Because we, we have see our challenges, but we also see challenges the way data is gathered. So one uh, issue which is uh, being debated in WTO on this gender disaggregated data, I think this will have to capture the reality of uh, different economies and societies also. Uh, we want to be analyzed and we want to analyze ourselves from a gender lens, but uh, a lens which is more akin to our reality. Coming back to uh, what can be done, I see a lot of hope in um, the work that we have um, just agreed to discuss and explore on miss miss and e-commerce yes. you see uh, uh, in developing countries 36 percent of the miss miss are owned or controlled or partially owned by women but hardly 10 to 15 percent they export so we see the challenges that miss miss have in terms of uh, trade uh, facilitation but more so in terms of uh, trade finance we know there is a hundred and 20 billion unmet demand in Africa, about 700 billions of unmet trade finance demand in, uh, in Asia. And uh, <coughs> most of these uh, refusals, if you analyze them, 90% of the women uh, get their trade finance requests refused, even if they are included in the financial systems. They have a bank account, but maybe the banks are risk averse or they look at women in a way that they rarely qualify to get uh, uh, trade finance. But on the other hand, there is a research by Asian Development Bank which shows that many women who are refused by these formal institutions are falling back to fintech for their uh, financial demands. So there the opportunity <coughs> of e-commerce comes in. But again, the challenge is that globally, you have 31% less women who have internet access. In Asia, it's about 25% less. In Africa, it's 23% less. And in Latin America, it is 30 plus. So that issue of uh, uh, access and digital divide is more manifest in, in the gender. So I, we see a lot of opportunity that when we will discuss <coughs> MISMIS and e-commerce and with a very strong underpinning of development and trade, so these issues, I think, are great enabler. 
uh, we see a lot of hope that with uh, the power of uh, digital economy, women can be uh, empowered to play a more active role. And uh, I think that would be, again, a key touchstone of what these two uh, disciplines like uh, Miss Miss and e-commerce offer to developing countries. <coughs> so it also has uh, a very strong risk you see, the other day I was looking at the UNCTAD uh, report, uh, the ICT report of <coughs> UNCTAD. It says on PayPal, 120 countries can't have a business account. So if women in 120 countries can't have a PayPal account, that means that uh, there, there is something wrong, whether in our own regulation or in the policies <coughs> of the companies. Same is being said about many universal e-commerce platforms which are being offered as a great opportunity that they are not uh, accessible as easily to many countries, especially to women in those countries as it is. And we are greatly looking forward to this Untied e-commerce week where this time <coughs> the subject is the development dimension of uh, e-commerce platforms. So uh, I would just end by saying that uh, one of the key issues, rather three, which WTO can bring to the table mismiss, e-commerce, and then services. 62% of uh, uh, women participate in the services sector. So coupled with e-commerce, mismiss, and services, there is a huge opportunity for WTO to contribute. Thank you. Thank you. So using the existing agenda and giving, making sure that we keep an eye on the gender perspective. Now, what can the business... Um, community do in more specific terms and do you believe in positive discrimination let me let me try to maybe give a fuller overview of you asked for practical solutions yes. um, there are four areas of work that the World Economic Forum is striving forward one is the data and rankings related work that I mentioned already the second is <coughs> dialogue this issue has to be kept at the forefront of the minds of leaders, and we certainly try to do that. I mean, just six weeks ago at Davos, um, you know, this was very much a, a key part of the agenda, everything from sexual harassment to very specific tools um, that both businesses and governments can use. So that's the second aspect. A third one is we strongly believe that a structured approach to public-private collaboration at a national scale can actually be one of those accelerators that will help us close this gap much faster than the 217 years. And um, five years ago, we six years ago, we started four experiments in Mexico, Turkey, Japan, and Korea, working closely with those <coughs> governments as well as the business community in those countries to take that structured approach and to agree that if we collectively sign on to closing that economic gender gap by minus 10%, how do we do that? And built through that experiment a lot of learnings of what to do and also what not to do. And now that we have uh, almost a sort of toolkit that emerged from that, we're now rolling this out across multiple countries. And in partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank, we've now rolled this out in Chile, in Argentina, uh, in Peru, and in Panama. In fact, Peru is just getting announced next week. And just at uh, Davos, um, President Macron of France signed on to this as the first country in Europe that would take a similarly structured approach. Um, and so for those of you that are, that are interested, I'm happy to, happy to share more, but we've seen it work and we do believe that it needs that kind of collective national level attention and approach. And then the fourth thing we're trying to do is, as an institution, we've spent a lot of time looking at the fourth industrial revolution and what it means for the future of work. If we want to change some of these gaps, one of those accelerators is planning now for the future of work and building gender equality into the structures of the future of work instead of waiting to fix the problem 5, 10, or 20 years from now. And we're trying to do that at we're still in early stages. The first part of that is trying to look at what are the roles that will be disappearing which tend to have employ large numbers of women. So we always tend to think of blue collar male factory workers, but actually there are women in service and administration <laughs> roles that are also going to be affected by these technological changes. So what are the reskilling and upskilling needs for those women? 
The second aspect is the roles that are going to be growing. So we know that IT-related roles will grow not just in the IT sector, but across multiple <coughs> sectors. And that tends to be an area where in some parts of the world, very few parts, there are only four countries where more than 50% of the students in STEM-related professions are women. Only four countries. In all the rest, Good women job. are not going into uh, trying to remember. I know Kuwait okay. and Brunei are, are two of them, and I'll, I'll try to remember okay. what, the, what the others are. Um, but they're only these. And so looking at how do you build that bigger pipeline of STEM talent has to be a critical part of ensuring that the future of work doesn't look like the present of work when it comes to gender equality. Thank you. Building the future. Monica, you've already told us um, a lot about what IKEA does and in integrating women consideration. Do you want to add uh, a suggestion, practical, and if you want also, what can the WTO learn from IKEA? Yeah, I can share with you some examples. As yes. I said before, everything is started by our, by, by our values. So it's important that we leave our values, we recruit based on values, and then we train the people accordingly uh, you, you have to consider that the IKEA products are sold in 49 countries, different cultures. Mm -hmm. So that is why it's so important that we understand that, I mean, gender equality is rooted deeply in our, in our values. Um, when it comes to uh, quotas, actually, what we do, we are deeply engaged also in the high-level panel on um, women's economic empowerment promoted by the U uh, United Nations. Mm. And we have a specific commitments with them. So, so first, I mean, by training people in values, you will assure that they will try to have diverse teams. Um, so everybody will be able to enjoy equal opportunities. But on the other hand, we also have extra commitments by engaging in these high-level panels. We committed by 2020 to achieve gender equality 50-50. We uh, also promoting equal opportunities and being able to measure it and to show mm -hmm. it and providing equal pay. Uh, and we are delivering so far as for uh, 2017 fiscal year, so it's until September. Uh, as I said before, 49 of our managers are women and, and 54 of our, our co-workers are also women. Uh, so, so you have already reached? Uh, yeah, well, there's a little bit to, to, to get when it comes to, I mean, in sharing in practice, you know, equal opportunities, equal pay, but when it comes to, yes, managers, and yeah, we are very close to, to that. Um, but, but, but we also think that this is good for business. As I said before, uh, women and men can contribute to business uh, in, in different ways. We have different uh, leadership skills. Um, so, so gender diverse teams <laughs> reflect society. And we are a company made by the many people for the many people. So we also have to reflect that reality. Mm. This is when it comes, this is one example uh, coming from retail. But also is when you are acting with suppliers. Um, at IKEA Code of Conduct, when acting with um, IKEA suppliers or IKEA service providers, is a kind of uh, black and white approach. If you want to be an IKEA supplier or an IKEA service provider, you have to comply with the code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of standards there uh, that has to do with environmental issues, working conditions, social issues, and definitely gender equality. Uh, by working together with them, because we develop long-term relations with them, so it's about trust and transparency. We learn from them as much as they learn from us. Mm -hmm. And then we together can come across different, to different kind of um, uh, activities or in initiatives in order to improve the things globally. The dialogue that Sadia mentioned. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, and, and it's also the engagement with the communities that we are doing locally and we are doing internationally. And I can put you also some examples. Uh, what, we, what we have here is these uh, social uh, entrepreneurs to contribute to the sustainability strategy, people and planet positive, the 2020. And then uh, with them we, we aim uh, both financial and social return of investment, is what we call the, mm. the double bottom line. And very often also the environmental return of investment, so it would be the triple bottom line. Um, so, um, how do we do it? I mean, basically, we from IKEA, we contribute with knowledge, we contribute uh, with, uh, well, actually to bring the international trade uh, to them through our stores. So, it's provide a global marketplace through our stores. In return, what we get from them is more vi vitality for our rents. 
So we can add in our range something a little bit different. Very often limited edition collections have made products that are sold in some, in some, in some countries. Thank you. I think the time is running out. I'm sorry, it's fascinating. Uh, but our DG will have to go. Um, you already gave a very broad uh, sort of a description of um, <laughs> your studies back to history, uh, confirming. I don't know, DG, w whether you would like to give us a last word before uh, you leave us. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, it was very, very illustrative uh, listening to this conversation. I think the one of the key answers to the questions you have been putting to us is awareness, is raising awareness, is understanding that this problem is out there. And unless we act, it's not going to solve itself out, or it's going to go in this glacier pace that Sadia was talking about. So we have to accelerate that pace. Now, there's so many different levels of actions that we need to take. Uh, we, I think what we have to do is, each one of us, uh, whenever we see an opportunity mm. uh, to help in this direction, we have to take action. Um, as uh, WTO Director General, I have a huge opportunity to do mm. that, and I think that's something that we are trying to do. Uh, at, from an institutional level, like I said, as an organization, as an employer, um, also culturally. And I think um, if you want to understand a problem, you have to have the right diagnosis mm -hmm. to have the right cure. And one of the problems we have is although we have these uh, data uh, historically, the reality is that most of the information and data and forms that we fill today regarding economic uh, activities, particularly in trade, they don't specify anything in terms of gender. So a lot of what we do is instinct. Um, SMEs, we know that SMEs, almost empirically, we understand that SMEs disproportionately uh, benefit women because there are more women uh, owners of SMEs than, than the big companies. So if we can help SMEs, we're offering women opportunities. Um, some industries are heavily, uh, count heavily on, on women participation, textiles, silk, uh, but in some countries, in China, for example, 55% uh, of digitally connected uh, uh, entrepreneurs are women. Uh, so there, this is an opportunity. In other countries, uh, in Tanzania, it's just 16%. So if we don't understand uh, where we are, it's difficult to take targeted uh, <coughs> measures. And, and just to finalize, uh, this goes at every level, even at the family level. I, 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 w I was raised in a house with three men and one woman. When I got married, that inverted <laughs> completely. So since I got married, two, two daughters, I have uh, three grandkids, all girls. Oh. So <laughs> happy coincidence. But um, the reality is that at, at, at home, at home, um, there was one thing that I always told my, my, my girls, my daughters, they said, you have to be financially independent. Whatever you do in life, you have to be financially independent because that's the only way that you're going to be the master of your own life. Um, and I think the grandmother is a professional, my two daughters are professionals, and I'm sure that my three granddaughters are going to be encouraged uh, to do that. But while we say that, I look around in the society, and I have to tell you, the Brazilian society is very liberal in terms of women participation and contribution. That is not the norm. That is not the norm. Uh, I was talking to my, my, my daughters the other day, and I said, we were talking about this, women empowerment and things like that, and they said, well, you know what shocks me, that in my generation, uh, sometimes I go to a dinner, and after the dinner, the men go to one place and the women go to another place. And I thought, well, it's because men want to talk about men things, right? No, that was not it. It was deeper than that. It was about the kind of conversation that men thought women were going to have, <coughs> which had, in my, in my house, that never happened. Uh, it was always all of us uh, together, that kind of separation between men issues and women issues, that didn't exist. For them, it was a shock. Um, so this has to be 
also at the personal level. Uh, we, we talk here about the, uh, the, the, the numbers <coughs> and how to target action, etc. But if we don't really believe in it, um, this, the world's not going to change with the pace that we need it to change. So that's, that's all that I wanted to say. I, I, I hope you will deepen this conversation throughout the, uh, the day and the week. Um, and any idea that comes from you <coughs> that can help us to target actions to close this gap, I think everybody wins. The world uh, wins big time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. It's a, a plan for the rest of our life on a daily basis to deal with trade in women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Sorry for my voice. Thank you very much.